I'm happy to be here. Brian, thanks for letting me fill your pulpit. Um, I want, first of all, thank everybody for praying for me. Um, I know the church and many of you here prayed for me while I was in prison last year, and I cannot tell you how uh, humbling that is, but how encouraging it is to hear of all the prayers. Thank you so much. I'd like you to meet my wife, Karen. She's here. We've been married 38 years. <laughs> Thanks for getting me out of jail, babe. Yeah. <laughs> the book of Acts. What a great book. Um, and just watching that and knowing that you've already covered the whole book of Acts up to chapter 28 uh, frees me up to tell some stories now because I love to tell stories. And I love the book of Acts because it is stories about what the Holy Spirit is doing in Paul's life and others' life. Um, during that original starting of the church and how people grew in their faith in Christ and how difficult it was, but also all the fantastic miracles and situations that they got themselves into and out of and, and that the Lord helped them with. And so as a missionary of 39 years now, um, I have a lot of stories too. I, I feel like sometimes a little bit of the book of Acts has been in my life as well. And Karen and I, we love the adventure of the mission field and being missionaries and serving the Lord but I also want you to feel that too, that the book of Acts is not just for people from thousands of years ago. The book of Acts is for us today. It still works. It's still, the Bible still is manifesting itself in us as we serve the Lord today. Um, I like the story in 28 where Paul, he's gotten over the shipwreck. Now he's been arrested and he's in Rome. And he's sharing with people um, every day in jail. And... Um, just before that happens, though, he was on the island of Malta, and he gets bit by a viper, a poisonous viper. Um, and everybody looked at him and thought, oh my gosh, he's going to swell up and die. And they said, oh, he must be a murderer. That's why he got bit by the snake. That's how things work. And he shook off the snake into the fire, and he sat there, and they kept watching the puff up and die, and he never puffed up and died. He just survived it. And what happened because of that was people looked at the other way. He said, now they're thinking he must be a god because he can do that. And then Paul was able to share with them it's just the grace of God and about a relationship with Christ. And of course, he won many people to Christ on Malta. But throughout the book of Acts and in our lives today, God is still doing wonderful things in people's lives in a lot of different ways to show others that he's active in their lives. So they looked at that and they saw in Paul there's something different about this guy. And one of the things that Paul said throughout his writings was his circumstances did not control his faith. He had a faith in God no matter what his circumstances were, good or bad. And so uh, one of my friends in the Philippines, uh, Jim DeVries, when I was first down in Davao many years ago as a young missionary, he got on a motorcycle in a hurry to go to a Bible study. And uh, I learned carefully over the years that you always check any vehicle you get on in the Philippines as soon as you get into it for creatures of any kind, you know. And he had forgotten that day he was in a hurry, so he got on. And he started driving his motorcycle, and he got going real fast and didn't realize there was a snake underneath the uh, handlebars of his motorcycle. So up came the snake out of the thing, and he went, oh, my goodness, and he leaned back like this, but he couldn't let go of the handlebars. And so it bit him on this one, and then it went over and bit him on this one. And so he pulled the motorcycle over, and he got the snake, and he killed it. And in the Philippines, when you get bit, you have to take the snake with you so they know what kind of anti-venom to give you when you go to the clinic or the hospital, wherever you can go. And so he grabbed that, he got back on his bike and rushed to the hospital before the um, poison could take too much effect and he could get help. And he ran in and he said, I just got bit by this snake. And everybody went, oh my gosh. Now in the Philippines, when Filipinos go, that means you're dead. Yeah. It's kind of a direct saying, it's all over. In fact, when we played basketball, and I played professionally there, if, if we were behind in the fourth quarter by too many points and not enough minutes to go, my guys on my own team would go, we're done, you know. So, uh, you know, Jim says, please don't click at me right now. Please help me. And they said, well, the problem is we don't have that anti-venom. So you're going to die. And Filipinos are also very direct, by the way. They just tell you this is the story. An American go, well, let's see, we'll give you some IVs and this could happen and this could happen. They just go, sorry. And so <laughs> he sat there, you know, and they waited for him to puff up and die and he never did. And I remember that so well. I loved it when Jim told the story and I thought, Missionary stories are great stories, but so are your stories. We all have good stories of what God's done in our life if we see him working in our life through grace. And that's the idea. Are we looking to God first? Sometimes in America, it's easy to think, 
the American culture will take care of it, or my money, or my career, or my own talents, or my political party, or somebody else will take care of this for me. But in reality, we all are dependent on God. The circumstances that surround us can go bad very quickly. They can be good sometimes. But what does not change is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the same. And so I've learned in my life when the circumstances got bad, I panicked too. But I quickly learned that relying on Christ is the one hope that can bring you through any situation. It says in Corinthians 12, my, my grace is sufficient for you. It doesn't mean only when this happens or only when that happens. It means my grace is sufficient for you always. Um, last year when I got arrested, of course, it was a shocking thing for Karen and I. And um, Again, I thank you for your prayers. It was humbling to see how many people in so many countries, I think 69 countries, uh, 49 states, uh, somewhere up around 65,000 people. Um, that was just individuals. But when you think of all the churches, the numbers in the churches, the amount of people that were praying for me that I found out about was stunning. And it also showed me how great and big the church of Christ is around the world. Well, you get, the church gets a lot of criticism in the world today, doesn't it? But we have a wonderful church of Christ. His church is thriving in many countries all around the world, including here in America, just like yours is. And I got to see the church as its best in my situation because their prayers for me encouraged me to try to stick in there and get through the crisis that I, I was in in that time. They came to our door about 5.30 in the morning. Um, we had been on a mission trip of our own, a missionary journey of about two weeks. I take basketball teams, and we play basketball all over the world, but mostly in the Philippines. And we share Christ at halftime after we entertain them. I do a unicycle show and a juggling routine and ride people on my shoulders on the unicycles and that type of thing. And so I would do that at halftime and then we would share with the people and many would respond. They want to get into a Bible study or they would want to come to a church or they want, want to come to Christ. And so you could sometimes lead some of the Christ right at the side of the basketball court. And we get the Bible into their hands and their languages. And I had taken my kids with me. Karen and I have 31 kids, 19 girls and 12 boys. And I'd taken a bunch of the boys with me, and we do a family unicycle show. And so they ride around with me. And I had my youngest, a 10-year-old, and he would ride on his little unicycle. I mean, it was cute, and it was fun, it was entertaining. But we always know that at the end, when you please Filipinos, you warm their hearts, they will listen to the gospel. They'll listen to you share. They feel like you've had the right to share with them. And so... We came home from that trip. We were all happy. We had over 6,000 people either come to Christ or come into the Bible studies to know about Christ. And so we were very excited. But we were also sick and we were tired. And that happens on missionary journey. So we were all getting well at the compound. And uh, the knock came at the door at 5.30 in the morning. And I thought, who's knocking at my door in my house at 5.30? Nobody would ever do that. It has to be an emergency. So I jumped up and went and opened the door. And the first thing I looked into were lights like this and a big camera. It said Channel 5 Television. And uh, I thought, what are they doing in my, my living room, taking pictures of me coming out of my bedroom? And there were a number of armed people there, the NBI, which is the National Bureau of Investigation. It's the most powerful um, and lethal security agency in our country. It's kind of like the CIA or the FBI, or maybe more like the KGB, somewhere in between that type of situation, you know. And so I looked at them. I said, what are you doing in my house, and why are you here? And they said, we need to talk to you. And I'm thinking, man, you could come at the middle of the day and talk to me. This is pretty tragic. You know, the guys got me by the arm. I said, am I being arrested? Oh, no, you're not being arrested. I said, do you have a warrant or something for being on my property and being in my house? We don't need a warrant. Okay, where are we going? They took me down in front of the house, and they brought Karen out. And Karen does not like to see anybody in her robe, by the way. So that was not a good thing. So oh, we're out there. And, and then they brought all of our kids out of the girls' dorm and then out of the boys' dorm. And the kids were frightened to death. They had, they had two dozen iron men out there. Um, and it was quite dramatic, if you know what I mean. For 31 kids and their parents, it was kind of an overkill. Um, but they didn't think so. And as I questioned more, if, did they have a warrant or what was going on? They said, you're not on arrest. They took me to the ground. And um, uh, physically, just a little bit tough. Got tougher in the vehicle going to Manila, but they handcuffed me and dragged me into a van. It's kind of embarrassing and humiliating and then scary to get arrested in front of your own kids and your wife and your staff. Um, then they took all the kids and put them in a bus and headed to Manila with them, and I got in the van. And on the way in the van, of course, there's a little bit of 
um, physical intimidation and then some asking for money, you know, um, the bribe and things. And uh, most people know in the Philippines, they don't know all because they keep asking, but I don't pay bribes and I never have in all the 38, 39 years I've been serving. And on the way, I thought I started praying because I thought this is really serious. Um, it took us five hours to get there uh, because of the traffic and some of the stops we made. And by the time I got there, I was exhausted and in and, and pretty rough shape. They put me in a corner on a linoleum floor, and they said, You'll just, uh, this is where you're going to stay till we figure out how, what's going to happen. And I said, what have I done, you know? And they said, well, your charges are very serious, and the length of sentence for the charges they put on me were 25 to life. And when you have a 25 to life sentence in the Philippines, that's so serious, they will not bond you. So you can't even get out on bond. So now you have to be in the prison until the, the trial finishes that proves you innocent. Um, they told Karen and I that it would be seven years, the trial, um, till they usually finish. So now we're looking at seven years of that prison, and I realized I, my lawyers didn't think I was going to last 24 hours in there, so I didn't know how I was going to do seven years. So it can put you in a bit of a panic state, obviously. Then I talked to the uh, Homeland Security, U.S. Homeland Security. They interrogated me for quite a while, and they realized there was nothing there and the mistakes that were made, but now it's very serious because now you're already in the hands of the Philippine authorities, and they're not just going to let you go either. And so they said, they're not going to charge you time, nor are they going to put you in jail. They're going to release you at the end of this. So just hang in there for a couple more hours, and it'll be done. And I said, okay, and I believe them. Um, but that's not what happened. Uh, what happened is they did uh, originally charge me, and put me in the prison. So I went and got fingerprinted and photographed, and then they strip you and they take everything. And they, I had one more phone call before they put me in. So I made a phone call and wasn't able to get through to Karen or anyone in Manila. So I tried Joe Coffee, which is Brian's brother, my best buddy, back in, in uh, Hudson, Ohio, and I got through. I said, Joe, I'm in trouble. And Joe's known me for 30 years too. So he said, uh-oh, and he didn't take that lightly. What kind of trouble this time is what he's trying to say. I said, Joe, I'm, I'm about to go into the pit of hell. I'm getting arrested. Could you pray for me? Don't forget me. I don't know if anyone knows where I'm at. He said, okay, Tom, don't worry. We'll, we'll pray and we'll do something. And I, they took my phone and I went in. And when I went in, I was, it, it feels panicky, of course, because you wonder, I'm 60 years old and, and uh, I'm not as young and spry as I used to be to, to deal with tough situations especially physical confrontations. So I was wondering how that was going to go, and I prayed when I went in. Here's what I've learned over the years, and here's what you also know. Our circumstances go from good to bad quickly sometimes, from good to better, back to bad. It can happen all the time, and if you're a Christian, it's going to happen to you. The book of Acts is about circumstances that go badly, and then how God turns them around to his glory using men like Paul, Stephen, Philip, and all of these great men of the Bible. And he does the same in our lives. And you can say, well, Tom... That's prison, that's pretty tough. And I can say to you, it's no tougher than your situations if you need help from God. If you're having a divorce or a child dies that you weren't expecting or you have a career that ends and you weren't supposed to get fired or you have financial problems, anything, physical ailments, bad health, to you, those are just as important as what was happening to me and they're just as important to God, those circumstances. How you deal with those, though, is how we deal with it as Christians. We should be able to deal with them as Christians better than other people because of the hope that is within us. We have a hope that other people don't have. So as I went in, I kept thinking about it, and I also thought, well, God has somewhat prepared me for this. I grew up in Detroit. Um, I was a thief growing up. It was basketball that got me off the streets and quit stealing and being in the gang and going to school. But I came to Christ later when I was in college. And do you know what's funny? I never got arrested as a thief but I've been arrested half a dozen times as a Christian. That, that doesn't seem fair, does it? In several countries. So it can happen. Circumstances can change. But the good thing about being a Christian is that I knew it was most important. My relationship between myself and Jesus Christ was most important and not the circumstances around me. And that's what Paul kept trying to say to us. In fact, Paul wrote four books while he was in jail in Rome. Um, he wrote Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, and Ephesians. Thank you, Brian. Brian had to correct me on that from the last service. Thanks for doing that, brother. <laughs> Better looking, much smarter. That's my problem with Brian. <laughs> Philippians. 
we played together in China. I don't know if I told you that. And he was such a terrific shooter, Brian was. And I was jealous of his shot. But you know how I fixed that? I decided I would shoot more than I could kind of equal what he was doing by just shooting more shots. <laughs> Philippians. Listen to this. He wrote this from this prison when he was in this situation in Rome. He said, uh, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Wow, that, that's pretty good. It's in all circumstances, every circumstance. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think what I love about what Paul says there is to me, as I grew up in America, started pretty difficult as a thief, and, but I had great parents. I ended up being able to go to college, and then I had a great life in America. Then I went to the Philippines and China and different countries, and I saw how difficult other people have it, but I started to realize it didn't matter what they had or didn't have. It mattered if they had Christ or not. So when I went into the prison, I went in thinking two things. Either you are in Christ or out of Christ. I didn't think if you were a murderer, you were a thief, you were a druggie, what your crime was. I just thought, are you in Christ or out of Christ? The second thing I thought of, really the first thing I'm sorry I thought of was I'm taking Jesus with me. Every th experience I've already had of being arrested or having difficulty serving the Lord in other countries, I always realized from Paul in the book of Acts, he never went anywhere without Jesus. If he was going, the presence of God was going with him. He wasn't going to face it alone. And so I had that confidence with me. And I went in and I said, I'm going to be the best inmate I could be because I thought if you're a good inmate, there's good things that happen with good behavior. And then I was going to share what I had and uh, whatever I could get when I was in prison, I would share it with others because prison in the Philippines, you don't get fed. There's no food and you don't get medical care. It's a little tough. And so you have to get food from somebody who loves you on the outside that might bring it or a visitor or from someone else in the cell block who shares with you. And then there's an understanding that you have to do something for him and so the system works. And so fortunately, I had a lot of people who loved me. So when I went in, I thought, I have stuff that I can share. I will share it. But it didn't take, oh, now you're going into a room that's about the size of Brian or most of yours living room. And there's 40 of us in that cell block one. And then 40 more in cell block two. But in our one cell, 40 guys, we had 12 guys that were um, in for multiple murder. They were hired, hired to kill people. Uh, we had a number of drug leaders. And then we had um, four Muslims. Um, two of which were from Iran. The Iranian built the bombs, and then two of the other Muslims had blown them up, one on a bus and one on a business. And I had to keep a close eye on those four guys because obviously in these days, it's not safe to be a Christian next to a Muslim extremist, is it? But I'm sleeping about three yards from several of them. And so I slept like this most of the time. You know, and if I turned over this way, I slept like that most of the time. And thankfully, I had a friend, Toto Luchavis, my best friend in the Philippines. He's been with me for 35 years. Thank God he got arrested with me, you know. Thank God for me, you know. For him, not so good, you know. But I was thinking, I'm glad we're in here together. Because it says in Ecclesiastes, two are better than one, three like an unbroken cord. When it came, and it, it didn't only take an hour before my first fight. When you have a difficulty and then you have two instead of one, you can stand back to back. It makes a little bit more formidable, formidable defense. So I was glad Toto was with me, and he was also watching our Muslim friends there um, to make sure I was safe. When they turned out the lights at night, it was scary. F Philippine prison is hours of boredom, boredom punctuated by a short burst of terror and violence, and you have to be ready for that all the time. Um, I survived the first confrontation, and... At 60 years old, I was twice as old as everybody in there and the only American. There were a lot of language groups in there. Um, and fortunately, I spoke bits and pieces of a lot of those languages, so I tried to make friends. I tried to do the best I can. But what helped the most was that Karen and my friends from the outside would bring me food when they could, when there were visiting hours. So I told them, bring lots of food. Don't just bring food to me. Bring lots of food. So they brought big buckets of spaghetti, and I'd feed the whole cell block. And, you know, that goes right along with Scripture, too. Because it says, and Paul did this too. In his circumstances, he didn't just curl up and take care of Paul. He was still encouraging others, wasn't he? And he was getting encouraging from other members of the church and the body of Christ. And so, I'm sorry, 
I, we had the spaghetti and we shared it with everybody. It says in Matthew 25, 35, Jesus says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Well, I could do every one of those things in Matthew. It says it, just do it. So I would share with guys. I would share my food with them. Even the Muslim guys, the four Muslim guys who hated me, it didn't take very long to know that if I was giving them food, they could survive. So they didn't hate me as much. In fact, after a while, they started to like me, and I became friends with a number of them. And after a while, they even asked me for one of my Bibles because I had some Bibles brought in. And after a while, they joined the Bible study. We had Muslims coming to Christ, can you imagine, in the prison. We had a Bible study of 16 after a while. Feeding everybody makes friendships, giving them something when they're hungry and thirsty. We can do that as believers. Sometimes that overcomes the animosity and the trouble, even the circumstances that you might be in. And I tried to be the best inmate that I could be. I took Jesus with me. Now, here's another thing that was really great for me is um, I found favor with the guards. And if you read the Bible, it says in here that even Paul, he did the same. He found favor with the guards. Um, it says in Acts, I'm changing, Brian, sorry. Okay. This message is not going to be the same as the other one and the one before it. If you're looking at the tape, don't get excited, okay? <laughs> Acts 24. Listen to some of what it says here. This is the book of Acts, Paul. He said, Then he gave orders to the centurion or the guard that he should be kept in custody but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. I mean, that was awesome. He, so Paul was getting favor from the guards, and I think part of it was God giving him the Holy Spirit that was reflected and people were attracted to him. Part of it was because the guard was attracted to what he was saying, but he got favor. And one of the things I got was favor. They let me have my Bible. They let me have my glasses, which you're usually not supposed to have because it can be a weapon. They let me have a ballpoint pen that's definitely a weapon. They were so kind to me that I could have that stuff. And I was thinking, the, the contrast between the beatings and then all this kindness and, and somebody me helping you, one of the first things they give you in prison in the Philippines is two two-by-fours to the back of the kidneys. It's on the board there, the Ten Commandments. You get this, this happens. If you discipline, this happens. It hurts, but everybody gets it. And then you get more if you don't cooperate, if you're not a good inmate. It encourages you to be a good inmate, I'll tell you. I already had that on my mind. Now, it goes beyond that if you have any more trouble. And the guards don't do that. The inmate council does that. They have an inmate council of mayor, vice mayor, and they're the ones who inflict the punishment. You can survive that. What you can't survive is when the guards have to punish you. I'm going to get to that a little later. Listen to this. Just a few verses down in verse 26 of chapter 24. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. I went through the same thing. They were still waiting for me to pay a bribe. It was quite a lot of money, but that could supposedly make everything go away. But as Paul, I couldn't do the same either, just like Paul couldn't, just like you can't either. But what do we have? We have a hope in Christ that we had leaned on something even greater than that. It says in Romans 8, 31, if God is for me, who can be against me? In Hebrews, it says, why, must I, why should I fear a mere man if God is for me? We have someone on our side that's more powerful than anybody that can resist us, that opposes us. That gave me encouragement. Karen gave me a verse. Really, really encouraged me. Because when I first went in that first day, even before the fight and everything, or the first uh, rough situations, I prayed um, this prayer that I knew. It was from Deuteronomy, promise of God. Deuteronomy 31, it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. That's a promise. A few verses down it says, be strong and courageous. And then it says in verse 8, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will, not, he will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And I was everything dismayed, I'll tell you. And Karen, when she first got to visit me, she came in. You, it, three days you're in solitary. You can't come out of your cell or anything. And that's a tough three days. And I survived everything the first three days. That was, to me, it was the toughest part when I look back. But I was so looking forward to seeing Karen. And so they gave us some, a couple hours visiting time, like from 10 to 2. I don't remember. It was 12 to 2 or whatever. And 
I went out and I was, they let me go out in the yard. They gave me a little favor, got me to go out early. So I went out in the yard and I was looking for Karen and looking for Karen. And here she came down the alley and I smiled and waved to her and she smiled and waved to me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm about to cry. And she beat me to it. And uh, of course, she looked at the situation. You got people around in these outfits and you got, it's dirty, it's smoky, it's hot. It's a lot of bars and you know what that means. And, and she cried and then I cried a bit and we sat at a table and talked for a while. And uh, the conditions kind of shocked her. There was a couple of rats that came by. And I mean big rats. This is not an exaggeration. In fact, the rats were so bad, Karen said, what are the cats and the dogs doing? Well, the cats and dogs were there laying on top of each other, you know, enjoying it. And then they'd see a rat go by and they'd act like they didn't see it. They were too big, you know. <laughs> not going to mess with the rats. In fact, at night, one of my jobs was, you know, you got lice in there and you got, you're on a piece of plywood and it's hot and sticky. You got a toilet in the corner to share with 40 guys. And uh, the big thing I feared was the rats at night because they would come around. When you fall asleep in a prison, like in the Philippines, you're so scared of getting hurt, you're always awake. When you finally fall asleep, you're just knocked out. And so the rats would come up and they would nibble on the end of the guy's toes. They'd get that little crusty, you know, um, scars on the end of the guy's toes and they would eat that. Sometimes they'd get up in the morning and they'd have a bloody toe. One of my jobs was to watch for the rats at night. So you didn't want to get a guy mad who had a bloody toe. But you can imagine it was different. And so anything could be encouraging. And Karen looked at me as we were talking there and she said, you know, Tom, we talked for about an hour. She said, you know, we haven't had an hour like this where we just got to sit and talk with us in a long time. This has been kind of good. Kind of, <laughs> kind of good for our marriage, she said. And I went, I said, well, I'll just get arrested once a year so we can have a great marriage, you know. And then she said, I forgot that she said to me, you know, Tom, you're becoming high maintenance. <laughs> It is tough on everybody when someone goes to prison, especially when it's unjustly. But it took them a while to find that out. So I just started to try to help the other guys in there. With my pen, I could write uh, affidavits for them because they didn't have a pen. and Many of them didn't write English, so I would write them out for them and help them in that way, or I'd share my food with them. And then I started to share the Lord with them. I was sitting at one point with myself, an Iranian, and an Israeli. Three of us sitting, going through Scripture together. Picture that in this world today. Jesus can do anything in people's lives. It turned out all three of them came to Christ, or both of them came to Christ in the end. But it was amazing to see how the Holy Spirit, even a place as dark as that, God could use anybody. In fact, when I think about it, I've been a Christian at that point 30 years. If I went into that situation, it was so dark, if I couldn't act like a Christian at that point, there wasn't much Christian in me, was there? It's a, the harder things get, the more our faith should shine, which happened to Paul through the book of Acts. The more the animosity and the stuff came to him, the more he shined for the Lord, Stephen, Philip. So we ended up having 16 guys in our Bible study. 16. We had 11 guys give their life to Christ. The Spirit started to grow in the place. We had... Two of my guards came to Christ, which gave me favor. <laughs> and um, when we saw that, oh, actually, three of my lawyers ended up coming to Christ. Do you know how hard it is to win a lawyer to Christ? <laughs> yeah. So as I saw this happening around me, I still had moments of hopelessness. I would pray and I would read my Bible. And I want to tell you, read the promises of God if you want to have encouragement. Don't read the news. Don't read the newspaper or watch news on TV. If you want encouragement, you can watch it and get information. Here's where the encouragement is. Here's where the truth is. Here's where our faith is based on. And that every day is this what got me through. I could do it from morning to night. They didn't mind. I would read and pray and talk to people all day. That's kind of what I did. Lots of time in prison. And as guys came to Christ, I thought, I thought, God is doing something special, and I got excited about it. And I felt a joy and a peace and a contentment that Paul talks about in Philippians 4 that I read to you. And it's an amazing thing. And you have access to the same thing, obviously, and many of you have experienced it. Whatever your circumstances are in America, they're just as difficult as my circumstances were in that prison to you. When a child is upset about something, that is the most important thing in the world to him, isn't it, or to her? And it's the same with us. Whatever we're going through, whatever circumstances we're dealing with that are difficult, to us, that's the most important thing right now, and it is to God and for you to deal with it. And the way we deal with it is like Paul said, do not let circumstances overcome your faith in Christ. 
Let that be the most important thing. Then you can still find joy and contentment, and you can even serve during the time of these difficult circumstances. You lose a loved one. You, what do you do? You draw close to God. I love doing funerals, baptisms, and, and um, marriages because people let me talk about God as much as I want. Those are the toughest circumstances. I lost completely where I was going. Babe? Oh, thanks, babe. Thanks. Um, um, can I have some water too? I'm sorry. <laughs> He's still a good pastor. I never passed much. You know? <laughs> Thank you. So, thanks, babe, for getting me back on track. Um, when, when we were young missionaries, there was a little guy. He's our jail. And there's a picture on one of our prayer cards. I'm, I'm paddling the canoe. We're going up river. Karen's in behind me. Um, I'm looking kind of rough. I haven't shaved, you know, kind of dirty. It's hot in the Philippines. You smell the Karen's behind me. He's not at her best either. And then behind her, I mean, you, you got to admit, it's the Philippines. It's 90 degrees. She was doing well. Our jail's right behind her, and he's, he's about four or five at the time. And that picture is a great reminder of what God can do because that boy, we ended up sponsoring him to go to school. And his father and mother, I had led to Christ. They were boatmen who took people up and down the river on the boat and didn't make much money, couldn't afford to send them to school. So as the compare, as someone who led them to Christ and now his, his compare, I became the godfather and she was the godmother. And we said to Argel, as long as you get A's, we're going to pay for all your schooling. And so Argel said, oh, that's great. And he got all A's. Elementary, middle school, high school, all A's. I went, oh, man, this is going to cost me because I made this promise. If you get all A's, I'll send you as long as you can go to school as you want. He came to me and said, I want to go to University of the Philippines. I went, stag me. It's one of the most expensive places in the Philippines. 300-year-old college, you know. And he said, I said, okay, what do you want to study? He said, pre-med. Oh, no, this is going to hurt, you know. And I looked at the price. I said, that's not very much. He said, oh, I forgot to tell you, Ninong. Godfather, I got a scholarship because of my good grades. This is just for food and lodging and transportation. I said, I can do that. So he goes all the way through that. He goes to medical school. He gets scholarships because he's done so good in, in pre-med. Now he's in medical school. He finishes medical school. We have a doctor. We're so excited. He says, I'm going to be a surgeon. Stay me. Five more years. <laughs> 30 years go by. Our jail is now a resident surgeon at Gen Philippine General Hospitals in the Philippines. It's a big hospital. Now remember, there's about, now there's probably around 18 million people in Manila, okay? I'm sick. He comes out of his surgery room. He looks up at the monitor, the television, and there's Channel 5 taking me and arresting me. And he said, that's my Ninong. And they said, he's in trouble. He said, he's also sick. Look at him. I can tell he's sick. And they said, well, he put him in the prison. And he said, where's the prison? They said, you don't know where the prison is? You've been here working here a year? He said, no, it's across the street, the place with the big walls and the barbed wire. I mean, 18 million people in Manila, remember? 98 million in the country. And God puts me in the prison right across from the same boy that Karen and I put all the way through school who is now a surgeon and a fantastic doctor, top of his class. He runs across the street and talks the guards into letting them in. He said, he's my godfather. They said, he's, he's a white American. He said, no, he's my godfather. They ask him. So they asked me, I said, yeah, let him in. He's my godson. And they don't let him in the prison. They let him all the way into my cell. They don't usually do that. And he came right into me. He looked at me and went. <laughs> I said, well, it's good to see you too, Argel. He said, Kuya, you look terrible. And remember, Philippines are very honest. He was just concerned. And he took my blood pressure. It was over 220. He said, Kuya, you're going to stroke. I said, great news. Anything else do you have to tell me? He said, I have to rush you to the hospital right now. I said, try. And they wouldn't let him, of course. It's a high profile case. You can't go to the hospital. So he ran across the street. And he brought the hospital to me. Only God thinks up these twists and turns. 30 years earlier, he knew our jail was going to be there. I believe that. Just be obedient to here. And here's the same guy we invested in. And he gave me IVs in my arms. And he gave me, um, what do you call it, blood pressure medicine to get it down. And infections. I had huge infections in my different places. And uh, I was in bad shape. And I started to get well. And as I got well, I said, Argel, heal these other guys too. Remember the verse in Matthew? I was hungry, you fed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. He started helping heal other guys, praying for them, treating them, 
and people got well and we got more favor and more people came to Christ. And so what a wonderful thing for God. Just like in the book of Acts, he helped Paul many times. He helps us too. When you trust him in all circumstances, you stay faithful. You can see the power of God move in your lives in America or in the Philippines. There was one room at the end. Okay, one room at the end. I'm going over. Apologize. If you have to run, just jump out, okay? I, yeah, I'm sorry, but I got to tell you this story, okay? There's a guy um, in a room at the end of the hall, at the end of the cell block, one and two. And if you go in that room, you're in trouble. That's when the guards discipline you. And at night, sometimes when somebody got taken there, you could hear them screaming and yelling when they'd beat him or torture him. And it was, it was just scary. You lay there and you go, oh, man, I'm glad I'm not in that room. And so Toto told me, boss, whatever, don't get in the room. Don't go to that room. I said, I'm not. And I behaved perfectly. And one day the guard said to me, Tomas, I said, yes, sir. He said, you're in the room. And everybody went. <coughs> and I went, oh, no. I said, wrong Tomas. He said, there's only one Tomas American in this prison. Get in there. Or we'll, I'll take care of you right here. You get in there. I said, yes, sir. So I'm walking down. There. My legs were just quivering because I thought I'd survived a lot at that point. But I wasn't going to be able to survive that, I thought. So I went in the room, they closed this big metal door behind me, and there was a little Filipino, about 5'3", five, 5'4", five, 120 pounds, 30 pounds, standing behind a desk. He stood up and he said, hi, Tom, and I went, nobody else in the room. I'm going, there's no way, I'm not that dead and that tired, you know, that he's going to wear me out. I'm thinking, so he said, no, I know what you're thinking, Tom, you're not going to be touched, you're not going to be beaten, sit down, I'm here to help you. I said, you are? And he said, yes. And what do you think Paul felt like when people came to help him? when he was in the prison, and the guards were nice to him, and he was back nice to the guards. Anyway, I said, sir, why? He said, I'm a Christian. I said, oh, thank God. I said, I want to hear you pray. He said, what do you mean? I said, I just want to hear you pray. So we prayed together. You know, the Chinese taught me this, because sometimes in the Chinese culture, there are people who betray the Christians, acting like Christians. They find out who they are for the government. I just want to make sure he wasn't in there with some interrogation trick. So I prayed with him. He was a real Christian. I gave him a hug. I said, thank you. He said, Tom, you will not be touched again. Listen to the book of Acts. Chapter 18. It says, and the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, Paul, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I'm with you and no one will attack you or harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. It's almost word for word. He said to me, you will not be touched or beaten again. He said, there's many people in that country who love you. You just keep doing what you're doing. I said, what am I doing? He said, you're sharing Christ in this prison. Everybody knows about it everywhere. He said, people are coming to Christ. So there's people on the outside who have sent me. I have six armed men around the prison. They know me here. They know if you get touched, there'll be trouble. I never got touched again. I never was bothered. In fact, I just kept speaking. In fact, I got bolder, which is Philippians, and we'll finish with this. Philippians 1.12, listen to this. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me in prison has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. I never, I read that and it was as real to me as 2,000 years ago sitting with Paul in a prison. And when your circumstances get difficult and you read the scripture and you trust it, it's the same for you as well, isn't it? Let's not worry about the circumstances in our country as they get worse for Christians. L look at it as a powerful time to do kingdom work as Christians. To stand above the circumstances with faith. You know, I tell people this and I really believe it. I sent a thousand texts to his brother back and forth. If you, want to, if you don't believe I was having faith in prison, read the texts. We had our ups and downs. But one thing I told Joe several times, I would rather be in prison with Jesus in the Philippines than be free in America without Jesus. Yeah, we need to. If you don't know Christ and you're in this room today, I highly recommend a relationship with Christ. And if you are here, I highly recommend get to know him even better. So when the circumstances get tough, you'll be able to walk through them. Not only with contentment, but in a way that exemplifies that to other people around you. Let's pray, and I'm sorry for being so long, everyone. Let's pray. Come on up, Brian. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all you do. Amen.